many respects, the opportunity here, I felt, was to bring people together who have an extraordinary wealth of experience in the industry, as it was, as it presently is, and goodness knows what it might become, but we're all still trying to work within it. You know, in the room, there are others who are involved in the industry very significantly uh, over the course of many years. So this is not going to be just us talking, but it's open to questions, a discussion. Uh, the interesting thing that James and I came upon when we first met was the idea of sort of conversations around the area of the creative industries, which are second only to the financial services sector in putting money into the exchequer of this country. It's a massive industry as a whole, of which there are many arms, uh, and they are challenged at all sorts of levels from the point of view of uh, the education system that provides the people to do the jobs, uh, so the funding of those things, when the productions get made, whatever format they're on, to the sale, the selling of those things, uh, and to recouping enough money to make the next one, which is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily difficult thing. Well, just um, uh, you know, for me, for the industry has changed hugely, and although it's very good that um, there is such a huge audience of consumers, people are definitely consuming voraciously, mm. which is fantastic. But um, part of what I do as a producer is I find projects, I develop stories, um, I put the whole thing together, but included in that is raising the money to make the projects. How do you monetize it when less and less people go to the cinema okay. and are watching on Netflix or you know, or they're downloading from iTunes or whatever it is that they're, they're doing? Um, also, I think young people um, have uh, a different attention span to um, I certainly had as a young person. I mean, they, they tend to, you know, I, in my experience, young people are dipping in and out of things yeah. and quite often don't watch things all the way through. But they also is this culture of kind of not expecting to pay for anything. Mm -hmm. So how do you monetize it? Which is why I'm now having to squash my budgets right down hugely um, and find uh, and, and you know you can do it but you just have to find new models and new ways of approaching how you make films and it's probably just worth explaining you know the, the, the older classical business model which was yeah. you know theatrical release dvd and home video window you know tv sales and you could pretty well predict because there was a sort of that was it that was it, it was sort of, in a way a monopoly by those platforms as it were um, and you could predict off the box office what the other the, what the sort of tail of that was going to be the downstream value that was going to be DVDs have gone totally so that market which we would get quite a big advantage from actually uh, even even five six years ago mm. we get quite a big advantage yeah. from DVDs so that market's just disappeared so it's now theatrical and in free download or mm -hmm. a Netflix deal or something like that. So yeah. huge slabs of your potential income stream just being removed, just literally dropped away. And then with the plethora of uh, TV stations and the online stuff, the business model is totally transformed. And in this country, it's worth saying, this is probably the worst country in Europe for indigenous films to get screen space on cinemas. Mm. UK cinema is completely dominated by American exhibitors, view, showcase, um, Sydney world, you know, the BFI is dominated by an American board and an American chair, mm. and it's very, very hard <laughs> outside, you know, the small, relatively small art house, you know, the Everyman's, the Sissy Screens, of which there are nationally maybe two or three hundred, I guess, something like that. Mm. It's very, very hard to get screen space, mm. so you don't get that first slice up there, and then so what's left? Uh, you might do a deal with TV, you might get, you know, it might, might be a Channel 4 BBC Films thing. But they're paying so much less than yeah, they used and, to. And they used to get, like, they used to have kind of yeah. set deals, depending right. on your, yeah. pretty much depending yeah. on your budgets. Yeah. Or distributors had output deals with Sky, for example. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, I remember yeah. getting £450,000 uh, mm. for the Sky window. Mm. Well, you're lucky to get yeah. £30,000 mm. now, mm. depending on mm. the budget and what it is you're doing, you know. But why is that though? Because you know, in reality, 
you've actually got bigger audiences for, the, for this content that's being created. You know, you've got more eyeballs, more ways to view it. You've got people are consuming more content. So there's a bigger audience there to monetize. You know, uh, yes, a film might only go into cinema for a two-day release in order to get the reviews, mm -hmm. but yeah. that's, that's because they know they're not going to get the audience there, they're going to get it somewhere else. You know, there should be more of an opportunity to monetize that. I mean, do you think that's a systemic issue? Do you think it's well, here to stay? The thing about some, something like Sky is most of it's subscription. Mm. So, you know, you can watch one film or you can watch 300 films and you don't pay any more money. So how does that work in terms mm. of monetizing what people are watching? And, and as Julie says, we've got this culture now, you know, from the music industry where, hey, all that content's why can't Free. I get it to nothing? Yeah. Uh, why, do I, why do I have to pay for this? Now, yeah. the, the, pirating, the music industry totally fell apart yeah, yeah, because right. of people expecting, just downloading yeah. for free. And then I guess pirating, Spotify basically. and stuff starts. Yeah. And, 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 and actually, in a way, the pirating, actually, probably in Europe, is much less than it used to be. There's a big fear within the industry about what the impact of pirating was going to be, particularly you know, DVD ripoffs and stuff. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, in a way, that's, I wouldn't say it's gone away, but that's changed. And I think that the difference now is um, obviously there's a limited amount of slots on broadcast, mm. you know, there are more channels, mm. um, but what's interesting I think now is that niche product is able to be made for niche audiences more and try and mm. connect directly with them, but the money in that is very small, mm. so you get, um, I made a documentary a few years ago that's about um, boxing in Cuba, it's about how the kids are trained from a really young age to... Um, become Olympic champions, and that's what they they aspire to and aim to. But it's not just a sports film; it's about sort of socio and economic scenario. And we self distributed into independent cinemas, and we did loads of outreach to boxing communities, Latin American communities, people studying politics, all of those sort of things. And even then, it's really really tough to get audiences. But where social media and crowdfunding and things has opened up a way to connect directly with a niche interest audience, mm -hmm. um, there is the opportunity to effectively pre-sell um, content to an audience that's willing to, to fork out for it, even if it's just a fibre to get a sticker on a copy of the download. Mm. Um, and I think you know there's always going to be massive amounts of gatekeepers on the way up to mm. the, the bigger slots and the bigger cinemas and the big broadcasters, but there is a way for content to reach mm. people. And I think, as I say, I think it's interesting with you know the crowd funding sources, you know, like, like uh, Kickstarter, how much people are willing to put up. You know, maybe any, you know, it's basically very often two or three times the price of a cinema ticket to have a film make its way, whether it's a documentary or feature or something. And it's interesting how quickly that money can aggregate. So there's yeah. people are, people are willing to spend money on stuff. Mm. Oh, well, I do think it's though, the mechanisms in place for them to do that easily and get what they want from it. Unless it's um it's some like someone with a cult status, a celebrity yeah. status yeah. who's raising the money. Mm. I think the statistics prove that um, most of the people who invest in other films mm. that are not celebrity based mm. are basically friends and family. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And there's a limit to yeah. you know how much you're going to yeah. raise doing yeah. it that yeah. way. There's so much choice that yeah. um, discovery and the way that people discover is, has really changed. You know, everybody used to use the Radio Times to work out what to watch on TV. <laughs> now, you know, I don't know what the circulation figures are, but I imagine it's dropped quite significantly. And, and actually quite a lot of it will come through social media, mm. through friends, mm. through um, traditional media and press. And that's where cast and, you know, names behind things will always be the, be the way to get... Well, that, that's now become crucial in terms of getting a theatrical release, a cinema release for a film, is names. You pretty much can't get a cinema release, or at best you'll get something called a day and date, uh, which means that it gets released in the cinema on a small number of screens, and on the, at the same time, on the same day, it will get released on a, on a platform, which might be whatever it is, Sky or whatever, you know. But if you have a crystal ball and we look a little to the future, my world is television, that's how I am my living. Um, I'm not saying I wouldn't want to shoot more drama if I wanted to, but our tellies are getting bigger. I'm at the moment being, I'm not actually being asked to shoot 4K, but the cameras are all sitting there. They want me to buy them, but at the moment, until the BBC decides it's going 4K, there's absolutely no point. But we will have 4K tellies. We'll soon have walls of tellies. Um, do you think there's a blurring will be... There's also been the rise of the documentary feature, which is a sort of television crossover. Um, yeah, I think that's the big issue with cinema. In, in, what, in the post-war years, what the figures were, there were 
you know, the entire nation went to the cinema every week kind of thing. The figures mm-hmm. were absolutely colossal and it just dropped off when television started and it's mm-hmm. basically flatlined from well, the 1970s onwards. It's, it has these minor peaks, but it's still sort of from where it was, it's way, way down. And so home, basically home cinema is mm-hmm. why go out. Mm. Um, I mean, it is pricey to get to It is pricey, yes. You know, you go yes. with kids and those yeah. things. Yeah. So it becomes, you, you yeah, that's right. spending yeah. 60, 70 quid oh, yeah, or something, yeah, you yeah, know, um, yeah. and then you buy the popcorn. Yeah, yeah. and if the film's not, <laughs> yeah, the film's not great. And, you know, if there's a dismal afternoon or something, do you want to go out? And that's, that's, that's the issue that cinemas mm. have got, is actually how do you compete against what is your comfy sofa, a nice mm. big screen and decent mm. hi-fi, yeah. pumping out sound. It, what's the difference? Uh, and, you could, and you could put the thing on pause and go to the loop. Yes. I'm, not advocating, I'm not advocating because <laughs> yeah. I love going to the yeah, cinema. Absolutely. But yeah. I'm just wondering yeah. 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 if yeah. Yeah. it's um, yeah. uh, probably will cinemas, a lot of high street cinemas go bust because mm. their real estate is so valuable. Mm. What do you see then that might be the door open in terms of we stay at home and watch from our comfy sofas? on a nice screen and we can go to the loo when we want to and have a cup of tea and all of those sorts of things and choose the content. Uh, you know, we would pay for that content by getting a license for that, you know, that subscribing. But it isn't necessarily the case that most people will and instead of saying, people are out of the habit of doing it, which is why the ind- independence has gone, why the press is struggling so much, why the music industry has sort of collapsed in many senses. Might there be... I think a lot of people are getting subscription services now. Yeah, I was just going to ask, how many people oh, okay. here have, like, yeah. Sky deals, you know? Or Sky, or Netflix, Sky or Netflix, or Netflix, or Amazon Prime, or whatever. I've got yeah. none of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. But what yeah, I'm wondering I've got, is... I've got lots. <laughs> is, that, is that enough to fund the industry making projects going forward, not just the big lot? Well, I, what's always interested me, you know, when the whole issue came up with the BBC Charter, which is, you know, and it's still an amazingly good deal, and it ought to be like 200 quid a year, I don't know why they didn't do that. What people actually spend on content with a, you know, with a, even a, a broadband brand connection, mm. if you're down there, you're spending that so much a month. You might have a Sky contract, that's 30, 35 quid a month. Mm. You might have a Netflix thing, that's cheaper. But when you add it all up, actually people are spending quite a lot of money on subscriptions for potential viewing, mm. Mm. how much they use. But, you know, you think, well, actually, so how much, what's the potential? If you said, actually, for another five or ten of a month, you could have whatever it is, mm. what's the sort of elasticity of that, of that mm. equation? But I think that's driven by people buying it for one thing that they've yeah. heard about. So it might be Orange is the New Black, Black yeah. or Making a Murderer yeah. or Top Gear or whatever it's mm. new called now, whatever it is. Um, mm. and, and then basically being lazy. And yeah. you know, everybody knows subscriptions roll on. Yeah. And actually, yeah. um, I know that when BFI Player launched mm. its um, mm. subscription service, mm. it has helped them meet their income targets mm. much better than individual mm. purchase. Mm. Um, mm. Because so many people subscribe yeah, see, for, yes, to yes. see one thing and then yeah. it carries on, or they sign up for a free thirty-day mm. trial mm. and forget and to forget to cancel it. Yeah, mm. that's. But you know, if that helps the industry, I'm not mm. knocking it. But I'm mm. just saying it's. It, I don't think mm. people necessarily do add up and no, think no, about that's what right, they're spending. That's right. yeah. mm. So is it is it that the the investment model in this kind of content creation is a capital investment. You know, big fixed fee up front, normally that's a big thing. But actually the revenue model is a, a P&L model. It's a long-term yeah. money back. And how do you how do you cover the costs up front, I suppose? Well, it's how you cash flow. I mean, it's yeah. interesting with us, with it's something like Sean the Sheep, every time we do a series, it's a few million quid. We'll get very, a little bit under half of that from actually the BBC and WDR for their licence agreements. And the rest of it is is promises to pay on delivery. So we have to cash flow what could be you know, a million and a half pounds or so on a, on a you know, 20 part kid series. And that's the same for most of the TV industry. Too. And we had to do this many years ago. We realised we weren't thinking up new stuff because we were so busy satisfying agencies and actually well-paid commercial work uh, that we actually said, unless we set up a popular little unit, only a couple of people, but actually to start developing stuff, it's never going to happen. So the, the tap is turning tighter yeah, yeah. Yeah. in some respects. Yeah. And new stuff that you would hope would come out would be generated where there's certainly the interest there. Yeah. It just can't because there isn't the money. And, and we had a, it, you know, it was interesting working with obviously where the Hollywood studios because as an independent producer, your sort of stuff, your money comes in by going into production. Your producer fees cut in. 
you know, everything's got first day of principal photography on the contract. So that's when the money starts. So it's not in the producer's interest to actually overextend the development bit. But actually, if you don't do that, the chances are that's not very good. It's a classic catch twenty two. Yeah, and yeah. you know, so the bigger studios, they all have big development department, and they spend a ton of money. And most of the films will neither get made nor mm. be, or might get made and not seen, or they might get made and seen and then flop. But they've got enough clout. But they know that's where you buy, you know, top quality people, and that's where you, you spend a fair bit of money. Mm. But the bulk of it is going to go down the pan. And that's just something you have to accept. I think um, we're obviously in a time of change, we always are, but maybe it's bigger change now. Um, I think we're possibly sounding a bit pessimistic. I mean, I know I'm in a slightly <laughs> different world. You're in yeah. the, the higher echelons of feature films and things, um, and I'm in television. But I do think that here we are, we're being filmed, you've got a couple of Canon C300s, fantastic quality. You wouldn't have done that a few years ago. It would have been too expensive. Um, and actually, if you didn't film a boring panel like us, you were doing something creative, you've got all that material, you've got all that equipment to do it, you can do it. And it is a sort of fantastic outlet for young creative people to make things. Of course, eventually, they're aspiring to your world, you know, they would like a properly funded feature film. Yeah. But, but you, can moment, a, you, can you can make a film on, on a uh, phone. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. Would you agree and that um, low budget features, the under 500,000, obviously not in animation, are now the new short in terms of people. They are, but why make them? I, you know, the eye features thing, for me, is a road to disaster. Mm. There were some, I mean, some years ago, we said there's something like 450 uh, single feature directors who will never work again. Because mm. they've made one feature on a low budget. It hasn't worked. So any financier says, well, look at the work they did. The pie is shit. I'm not going to make it with that. <laughs> and it's the end of their career. Yeah. Whereas if they said, actually, I've got five award-winning shorts yeah. that I've done over six or seven years... God, you've got a good track record. And actually, I trust you with a bigger story now. But here's a, here's a positive then, yeah. because actually, because film and high-end TV is blending, yeah. Yeah. people can start in shorts, maybe go into TV, yeah. and then come back exactly. out towards yes. features, or yes. blend the two. Yes. And again, with development, you're seeing a lot of production companies working across TV mm. and film, which mm. you know is difficult, because actually, it's a totally different set of relationships. Mm. But mm. from a kind of cash-flowing point of view, it's probably easier to do TV mm. than it is to do... Yes, absolutely. Features. Yes, there's more need, more need for it. It's not really all doom and gloom. There will, a model will evolve, yeah. as it sort of has done with the music industry. It went to a big, big, big uh, issue, but it's sort of beginning to, you know, like well, they live, make their money from live, from live shows. So, yeah, you know, they? and that's that's, that's yeah. the excitement thing. What about the YouTube model, right? Okay, where people are building an audience first probably creating some pretty awful content to be frank but um you know developing that and then monetizing that as a as a different way of kind of funding and growing i mean it, are there lessons to be learned there for kind of you know uh, the crafts and the creative and the filmmakers and the it's an interesting one because actually it's, it's the same rules apply you're still a kind of you're kind of a broadcaster i know we've done the morph thing through youtube it has its own youtube channel You've got to feed it, so we have a couple of guys that are always putting up new content almost every week to keep people coming back to it. It's again, it's a long burn. Uh, we're just we're just on the verge of breaking even, even through sort of the advertising revenue. How many subscribers? Well, we got. We put, I think we just hit about the kind of the kind of the million, and at which point it starts to take off. Sean the sheep. The the interesting that's in, the thing that's interesting is that we get we have a, a Timmy Time YouTube channel as well, and we get quite a lot of money from people uploading to me time, particularly in Asia, oddly enough. Um, we sh we think that's our answer, we'll have the advertising revenue. So we're the, you know, it's a preschool property, parents love it, so they upload it. Um, and interestingly, in broadcast this week, the whole you know, item about the way YouTube's going into basically becoming a TV station, mm -hmm. you know, commissioning half hour pieces mm -hmm. um, back to a kind of half hour grid. What is interesting about it, I think, and we, when we launched Morph, it's quite a funny story, this, because we, uh, YouTube said, look, you know, do you want to do something at, at Google Towers in London for your kind of launch day? And we thought that would be fun. So we went up, and the morning we spent with journalists talking about Morph and getting to make Morphs and that kind of stuff, and in the afternoon, they wheeled in about, I don't know, 10 or 15 sort of YouTube gurus. who were, you know, these people that get millions of hits, and they're mostly male, 23, spotty, you know, the classic YouTube nerd. 
<laughs> and with their various specialists. And one bloke walked in who was, I thought, well, he's clearly not one of them. He must be an executive from YouTube because he had a, you know, look, just look completely different. And I got chatting to him, and but he was a YouTube guru and got, and got millions of hits on his channel. And I said, what do you do? He said, actually, I make videos of models of construction equipment. <laughs> and I'm like, shit. And I thought, okay. And, it, and I thought, that's narrow, you know, that's the narrow casting. But if you're into models of construction equipment, you go to his channel. So although it might be kind of po not, not one of the population mm. globally, it's a, f a good few hundred thousand people. And he'd got that niche. Mm. And I thought, that's what's interesting, is so that if you can work that niche, if you can reach those niche demographics, you can actually get it to work. And, you know, in animation, I'm, animation's a very broad church in many ways, but there are ways in which you can find those type of niches, because it's narrow casting rather than broadcasting. And those, you know, we all know the guys that are talking about how to win at Minecraft or apply makeup, mm -hmm. those big things that young mm -hmm. kids want to do. But also it's, they're branching out into live experiences, yeah. so they're doing meet and greets at some in the right. city, or yes. they're running tours, they're putting books out, they've you know, they've got makeup lines, you know, they're not they're not making most of their money or mm. I don't yeah. know, they're mm. they're not it's, it's advancing their the career exposure. just from the channel. Yeah. They're using yeah. it as a springboard to other things, yeah. and then you're seeing channels like BBC Three reaching into those yes. channels and pulling yes. out talent to put them then through BBC stuff. So yeah. I think it's quite an interesting um, proving ground, but again, really, really difficult to to get those numbers without advertising yourself. I mean, we looked at mm. this for the app that I was working on, which was effectively a way of creating a piece of animated content on your phone, so you could pick a character from a range of over 20, re record your voice in for up to 30 seconds, add different animations, and then export it directly to Facebook or YouTube or wherever. And um, we were trying to create a kind of um, crowd content channel um, where people would be recommending their friends and creating a, you know, a virtuous circle. But I think it was just so difficult to get people's head around the technology, and also to to get create people, get people to come there as a destination to watch without any celebrity endorsement or any paid advertising or any of those things. It, it you know it was really um, an uphill struggle. And I think the trouble with people, some people being successful is everybody assumes they can do it. And you've even got courses now where you can learn how to be a star vlogger and all this sort of thing. And I think you know, the reality is, is those people cut through for a reason, but you know, that, that's history now and there's gonna be something new coming through. One of the possible things that I know that they're exploring in the States is the ability for people, when they just click on something, that some money comes out of an account and goes directly to the producer, which seems like a, a, a direct way of funding, rather than the sort of crowdfunding where you ask people to put money in, mm -hmm. but you've made the product and then you get a, a means of revenue, a revenue stream mm -hmm. from that. That sounds wonderful. That sounds good, doesn't it? I mean, it it's been trialed and I've seen it at, at various conferences with the idea of, well, you have so much money on your card, your virtual card, and you can spend points of mm -hmm. a penny or cent you know, in various ways. I mean, that would seem like a, a good way of you saying, I do want to watch this. I'm not going to subscribe via a gatekeeper. I'm going to go direct to the producers. And as a price point, I remember the, I mean, when the BFI player started, I was a bit shocked at how expensive it was for like 10 minutes, and I thought, it's just telling me to bog off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the microtransaction, what, yes. what is, you know, if it's just a, if it, a few pence or 50p, you think, actually, I'll, I'll, that's worth 50p, and actually, I'll do it again, mm -hmm. you know. So, what, the, what that value for money is, and that it's probably, you know, I, think, I don't know what the figures are, but it's something that is a relatively small amount of money, so it doesn't become painful but yeah. something you're more liable to do time after time because you, you, you think you're getting good value for money for it. I, well, I'm, the BFI player was it was £3.70 for a feature film and it was something like a quid for 10 minutes yeah. or something so I thought bloody hell this is actually pretty expensive it's just telling me to bog off mm -hmm. I don't I can't at that price I've got to make decisions about where I'm going to put my money had it been 20p or something mm. for 10 minutes that would fine I'll, I'll watch five of these in that case I think yeah. that unfortunately because of the way their platform costs were funded yeah. in the capital yeah. investment yeah. the kind of expectation of how that plays out in terms of yeah. cross financing because there's also so much free content on there yeah. which is subsidised yeah. by lottery money so I think they've kept they've held the price of some of the bigger name features yeah. the stuff that's got the stars and that's really done mm. well at the festivals mm. higher 
Um, but yeah, standard was about mm. three eighty-three, mm. I think, was for yeah. a feature, which was a bit mm. of a strange number. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. But I think also curated. Um, they're, they're going kind of heavily down the curating route mm. and creating packages of shorts or whatever yeah. for people. Yeah. So it's not like you have to do the discovery yourself, but somebody yeah. expert or you know, with a particular niche interest is putting stuff together for you and that's the price you're paying. Absolutely, yeah. and, th and I think that's one of the key things, um, it's, it's, which is what a broadcaster does, you know, mm. BBC One does this, BBC Two does this, you can go to a kind of, kind of like, a, like it's a trusted brand, isn't it? Yeah. I'm going to get good content, I don't know what it's going to be, but I know it's going to be good, that's what you go there for, and I think that's the key to a lot of that online stuff, people want trusted curation that fits yeah. their Nobody's needs. Nobody's got the time to find it all. No, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, yeah. yeah. I think we're going to have to draw it to a close. I'd like to thank you guys, guys for being here. Thank you very much for coming to listen to the first organic panel. <laughs> uh, I hope that was informative. There aren't answers. This is really a seismic difference that is happening within the industry. Digital is now everywhere, though the next film I may be doing may be on film. Uh, and people are using whatever technology and tools are there. I'm shooting some film next week Yay. on a Bolex. <laughs> First time in 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the film that I recently did, which is now out in uh, festivals, that was shot on 16mm. But they're just tools, and ultimately it's about story and content, where to find it. Is it valuable to you? Do you expect to pay for it? Those are questions that are outstanding, I think. Uh, but look to your own lives and what you do. You know, is there a value to the thing that you're getting? Is it appropriate to therefore support the people who are making that? What do you want to do with your time? I think it's a valuable it's a thing to think about. Uh, but thank you very much, Laura Giles, no Chris Fire, David Sproxton, Julie Baines. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I hope that was informative. I hope you're going to be able to make sense of that in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>